recording now. And are we live on Facebook? Can, uh, can my team who are watching on Facebook give me a thumbs up in the chat if they're seeing me on Facebook and on YouTube? Live on Facebook and YouTube. I was like live from the Apollo. All right. Well, I guess that is our cue to begin, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. And thank you all so much for joining us today for this online forum on equalization. My name is Paula Simons. I'm an independent senator from Alberta, and I'm honored to be speaking to you today from my home in Amiskachewakhegan. That's Cree for Edmonton, at least that's my bad Cree for Edmonton, here in Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and enduring home of the Cree, Nakota Sioux, Salto, and Blackfoot peoples, and one of the heartlands of the Métis Nation. Wherever you are, welcome to today's discussion of equalization with our five remarkable guests. Today, we are joined by Dr. Trevor Toome, an economist from the University of Calgary who has written widely on equalization and fiscal transfer policy in Canada. Dr. Jared Wesley, a political scientist from the University of Alberta, whose particular area of study at the moment involves explorations of Alberta identity and identity formation. Dr. Mary Janigan, a journalist and historian and the author of the new book, The Art of Sharing, Subtitled, The Richer and the Poorer Provinces versus The Richer versus the Poorer Provinces Since Confederation. Eric Adams is the Vice Dean of the University of Alberta Faculty of Law and a Professor of Constitutional Law and Canadian Legal History. And Ken Bosenkuhl is a an economist, a longtime conservative political strategist, and the J.W. McConnell Professor of Practice at the Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill University. I'm going to start with a few questions for our panelists, but I don't want to do all the work today. I want to leave time for you to ask your questions too. So you can do so in three different ways. If you're watching on Facebook, you can post your questions there. If you're watching on YouTube, you can post your questions there. And if you're on Twitter, you can send questions directly to us too using the hashtag EQAB, EQAB. And if you're live tweeting, please do use that hashtag too so people can follow your tweets even if they can't watch us live. Behind the scenes, my amazing staffers, Cynthia Wagner and Dina Dong, will be forwarding questions to me so I can pose them to our panelists. I think that's all the introducing I need to do, so let's jump right in with our opening questions. There is so much myth and so many misunderstandings around equalization, including a persistent belief somehow that the government of Alberta writes a big equalization check for Ottawa. So, Trevor Toome, I want to start with you. You're an economist who studies fiscal federalism, can you start us off by explaining in simple terms what equalization is and how it works? Well, I can certainly try. And first, let me say thank you, uh, Senator Simons, for hosting us uh, today. Hopefully, this is one of many great conversations that Albertans will have uh, between now and October prior to the referendum on equalization. So to understand that program and how it works and what its objectives are and how it functions, we do need to keep in mind first that Canada is a very large and diverse country, both physically, of course, but also economically. And these regional economic inequalities are large. And, and I guess for perspective, uh, the latest data shows average family incomes in Prince Edward Island, for example, are, are just shy of $69,000 per year. Whereas in Alberta, uh, they're about $100,000 per year. So these large gaps in income are important because it means that in low income regions, those governments have a harder time raising revenues to deliver core public services than governments of high income provinces do. So what equalization tries to do is bridge those divides to ensure that Canadians in any region of the country have provincial governments with the fiscal capacity to enable them to deliver normal levels of public service at no more than normal rates of taxation. So how the program works in essence is we calculate how much a provincial government could raise if it had typical tax rates, if it had average tax rates. So we look at personal income tax, corporate income tax, consumption taxes, property taxes. We gather together almost all the sources of revenue for provincial governments and ask, what would you raise if you had normal average rates? So in Alberta, that's about 11,000, a little more than $11,000 per person. 
And in PEI, it's about $6,700 per person or so. So there's large differences in provincial government's ability to raise revenue. So then equalization says, well, if your ability to raise revenue is below average, then we're going to provide you a top-up payment to bring you up to an average level. And that's why PEI receives approximately $3,000 per person or so uh, in equalization, Manitoba to Quebec, about $1,500 per person, because that's the amount they are below the national average. And so the equalization tops them up to that average level to ensure they can deliver the health care and education at a normal level of quality that Canadians elsewhere uh, enjoy. Now, before concluding, one important uh, thing to keep in mind with this program is, uh, as you mentioned, Senator Simons, it's, it's not funded between provinces where you have Alberta, Ontario, BC writing checks for recipient provinces elsewhere. It's entirely and completely a federal program funded out of federal taxes. So it comes straight out of general revenue. So it's the same budget that we use to buy paper clips and office supplies, uh, pays for equalization. And so it's a federal program um, that has existed now for quite a few years. And while it's, its design and the formula has changed over time, and there's lots of important debates to be had around uh, what tweaks we can do to the formula, that principle has existed now for, for quite some time. That principle embedded in the Constitution that we'll perhaps talk more about that says that we're committed as a country, as governments, federally and provincially, to ensuring that normal, comparable levels of public services can be delivered at normal and comparable rates of taxation. So in a nutshell, that's the equalization program. That is terrific. That is a great way to introduce uh, the panel and to introduce everybody to the, the basic concepts of equalization. Now, Mary Janigan, you're our historian, and I know from your book, The Art of Sharing, that Australia was one of the models for Canada's equalization program. Can you explain why these two federations decided they needed something like equalization in the first place? What, what problem was it designed to solve? First of all, thank you for having me, Senator. What happens is when you get into an industrializing, modernizing society, you can't rely on churches or your neighbors anymore to provide social assistance. Uh, it, there's simply not enough money and enough capacity to do so. So you need to introduce national social programs. In Australia in the 1930s, caught in the grips of the Depression, it, the situation was even worse. There were tariffs up to protect the manufacturers in eastern Australia, but the miners, the farmers in western Australia wanted cheaper consumer goods. They were tired of paying taxes for very poor roads, bridges. They voted to secede in quite major numbers. A secession vote was then handed to the UK. Uh, the UK didn't know what to do with it. But meanwhile, Australia knew, the federal government knew it had to do something. It brought in equalization. This ensured that federal revenues, as Trevor points out, they are from the central state, but not all models in other countries do this. Germany, it's among states as well. I digressed. But in Australia, they arranged that federal revenues went to the poorer provinces, so that the state, so that they could provide social services, they could spend it on infrastructure. It brought peace to the Federation and some kind of equity. Canada couldn't get there for the longest time. We had the prairie provinces on the brink of bankruptcy. Alberta actually defaulted on its bonds in 1936. A Canadian Royal Commission came up with a proposal for equalization, a different type of approach, a different formula. It wasn't viable then. In 1956, Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent understood he had to do something. Ottawa was collecting provincial taxes in some provinces and providing extra funds to those provinces that were poorer 
Quebec was out in the cold. It wouldn't allow Ottawa to do that. Louis Saint Laurent separated any tax collection from the compensatory payments and began to deliver them in 1957 to poorer provinces. That ensured peace in the Federation, equity, and all of the provinces were able to join national social programs such as hospital care, medical care, post-secondary education, social assistance. It is a principle that keeps a federation together. It's a principle. But bearing in mind the conversation that's to come, I also note that, as Trevor noted, it has a formula. If provinces are upset, Ottawa has the ability to change the formula. That remains the primary principle. Ottawa can change the pragmatic approach, but the principle of equalization, sharing amongst the poorer and richer provinces, is the only way truly to keep together a modern federation. Terrific. Thank you so much. Jared Wesley, I turn now to you. Much of your recent research as a political scientist has revolved around Alberta identity and the formation of Alberta identity. So I'm going to ask you, why does equalization make so many Albertans so angry? And how does it shape our view of ourselves as a province? Well, and thank you, Senator, for inviting me here with, with the fabulous panel to talk about all of these various aspects of equalization. And um, you know, Trevor and Mary have teed up kind of the historical and economic side of equalization. I'd like to talk about the symbolic part of it, because this referendum at, at its heart is really about equalization as a symbol more than it is as a, as a program. And we know historically, Alberta political culture has been built around one particular theme, Western alienation. This idea that Western provinces and people that live there are being exploited by people in central Canada in particular in various ways. And equalization over the years has come to symbolize that exploitation. I think also Alberta political culture has earned a reputation for being conservative. And part of that conservative brand involves, I'm not saying an opposition to, but definitely a reluctance to support redistribution of wealth in general. So what we find through our research is that people that are most opposed to the concept, the principle, the inner workings of equalization are also likely to oppose notions of progressive taxation, where we move uh, funds from one person to another. And part of that's bound up in this sense, not among all conservatives, certainly, but among uh, certainly among the most right wing conservatives in this province, that, that people uh, that enjoy prosperity have done so through hard work and people um, that don't enjoy prosperity uh, may have not worked as hard or are doing other things that are not necessarily deserving of that revenue. So a lot of people that oppose equalization oppose it on either Western alienation grounds or on, on the grounds of wealth redistribution. Now, our research, as you mentioned, has started asking uh, the questions in a little bit of a different way. We've asked uh, two sets of questions of participants over the last couple of years. The first one through focus groups asks Albertans um, how they feel that a typical Albertan uh, would behave or react to different things. And in particular, we've been asking them about equalization. How would a typical Albertan react to this, this referendum that we're, that we're seeing in the fall? And then the results surprised us because most people say the typical Albertan doesn't stay up at night worrying about equalization. Um, so in that sense, I guess, Tre Trevor, <laughs> who's fantastic research in this area, it makes him an outlier <laughs> of, of sorts tracking the ins and outs of the equalization system. And, and that, that finding that the typical Albertan isn't really worried about equalization is backed up by our public opinion research, where we do surveys that show that most Albertans are relatively indifferent to elements of fiscal federalism, whether that's because they don't understand them or whether because they prioritize other issues like economic development, um, healthcare, and most recently the COVID-19 pandemic. So as a principle, as a, as a symbol of Alberta's, um, Albertans' opposition to, to wealth redistribution and to exploitation by Eastern Canada, I think we're starting to see a thawing in Albertans' attitudes towards equalization. Of course, it will, we'll find out, I suppose, this fall, uh, when we see how many people turn out to take a ballot uh, and then how many people actually oppose uh, 
the notion of equalization being embedded in the Constitution. And that is the perfect segue to my next question for Professor Eric Adams. Equalization is literally written into the Constitution. So can you, as a constitutional law expert, explain why it's there and whether the referendum question Albertans will see when they get to the polls this October will have any impact on the Constitution? Well, thanks, Senator Simons, and thanks, too, to my uh, co-panelists. Uh, it's been a treat to be uh, just listening already to the comments uh, made. Um, I think it's important to start by noting that um, what everyone has already referred to, which is the principle of equalization, is distinct from the particular formula that may be used to determine how much money in the federal program is taken from which taxpayers and given to redistributed to a particular province. So there's a distinction between the principle on the one hand, the idea to quote Mary, you know, the art of sharing, the principle of sharing across the federation, that's the principle. The actual practice of how that may look in, in, uh, in what money and how much money is taken and, and how is it distributed, that's the, that's the mechanism. And what our, what our constitution protects in section 36.2 is the principle of equalization. It commits Canada as part of the supreme law of Canada to maintaining the principle of equalization, the art of sharing. And that is the referendum question that Albertans are being asked. Would we like to get rid of, not the formula, not the mechanism, would we like there to be changes in how or what is distributed and in what ways no, Albertans are being asked, would we like to get rid of the principle of sharing in the Federation? And that's a very important point, I think, that Albertans need to think seriously about. There can be all kinds of reasons and all kinds of, I think, differences of opinion about whether the formula should be revised. And periodically, of course, I think we can probably agree that it needs to be reviewed and revised on the of our Federation change. But do we want to give up on the principle of sharing across the Federation? Because that's the question we're being asked. Why is it in the Constitution? It's in the Constitution because in 1982, Canadian parliamentarians said Canada needs a constitutional renewal. And most Canadians are going to be familiar with one part of that renewal, the addition of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But there were other important aspects that arrived in 1982 the amending formula, which told you how the constitution could be changed. Indigenous rights and treaty rights were added to our Supreme Law of Canada. The provincial jurisdiction over natural resource development added in section 92A in 1982. And so was equalization as a principle. It was a practice that already existed in Canadian government uh, uh, fiscal federalism. But in 1982, Canadian parliamentarians said, let's turn that practice into firmer constitutional stuff, because it's important to how this country can work as a nation. Now, the last part of your question, Senator Simons, a referendum. What role does that have in changing this thing that we call the Supreme Law of Canada? Well, it has no formal or independent role. A referendum, a referenda, and the Supreme Court has clarified this, does nothing in terms of changing the constitutional law of the country. Of course, any province has the power to initiate and request any kind of constitutional amendment they may like. And that's just part of being part of a democracy. We want that to be the case. Constitutions aren't perfect. Maybe they need changing. A province can initiate constitutional change, but it is a collective document signaling a collective enterprise, this thing we called Canada. So no one individual province can change the collective aspects of our Supreme Law of Canada. And that frankly just makes sense. So if you want to amend this thing, you've got to get broad provincial and federal support across virtually all of the major provinces of the country. What does Alberta say? Well, a referendum will create a political fact that Albertans are against the principle of equalization. Maybe it will, or maybe we won't, maybe it won't, but the referendum itself about that principle has 
nothing really tangible to say about whether or not our constitution, in fact, will be changed. Okay. Ken Bosenkuhl. Back in 2001, when Ralph Klein was premier and Jean Chrétien was prime minister, you were one of the original authors of the firewall letter, which uh, laid out a path for Alberta to sort of wall itself off to an extent from the rest of Canada. And you've been writing about equalization for years. So what problems do you see with the program? And do you think this referendum is the best strategy to address them? Well, thank you, Senator, for inviting me here. Uh, your journalistic uh, hues are showing in that complicated question. So let me... <laughs> let me I don't know, uh, journalists are supposed to ask simple, straightforward <laughs> questions. I think I'm turning into a politician. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Um, so let me let me just unpack a few things there. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is that when Stephen Harper put a few of us around the table to craft what has become known as a firewall letter, one of the most important instructions he gave us was he wanted us to do things and put things in that letter that Alberta could do unilaterally. He didn't want things in that letter that relied on other parts of the country to do things. And as a result, equalization does not make an appearance in the original firewall letter because every one of those things we wanted, he wanted in particular, uh, Alberta to be able to do on its own. And most of those uh, things that were in that letter, those five things in that letter, were things we could do on our own. So I just wanted to set that, that initial groundwork. Next, you asked me what are the problems with, with equalization. Uh, Tom Corshane was my mentor for many years on these matters, and Tom always said to me, the root of every problem with equalization is natural resources and natural resource revenues. And every time there's been big swings in natural resources, and guess where that mostly comes from, the province of Alberta, that creates enormous strains on the program. And so the question of how to treat natural resources in equalization has been probably the biggest challenge with equalization. And, and I think the fundamental problem here is that revenues from natural resources are not like revenues from other tax sources. Revenues from natural resources are more like uh, are more like a capital asset and the income from a capital asset as opposed to income that you charge. And in my view, equalization should account for revenues that are ongoing as opposed to one-time revenues, which are revenues from natural resources. So I've argued in the past that natural resource revenues should be excluded from equalization. Wow, that creates all kinds of tension because Alberta suddenly has all this money and the rest of the country looks at us and say, hey, how come they get all this money and how come we don't? And then you get into the ownership of natural resources. So uh, there's a lot there, and I can talk more about that. But I think that's the, that's the one big problem uh, challenge with equalization from a technical point of view. The second challenge that I have identified over the years is what I call the math in, math out problem. And I think equalization can receive its most uh, political support across the country. And I'm a big supporter of equalization. I can get into that if you like, even as a conservative, even, even as a conservative Albertan. Um, it gets political support if people know that no one is tinkering with the program. If the program is is you have a bunch of inputs and then weird wonky people like, or not weird, uh, wonderful wonky people like Trevor can calculate all those inputs and produce an output. And what's happened in the last number of years and where a lot of these tensions come in, we put floors and ceilings and we put various uh, different aspects into it, which makes the program over time unpredictable. And so I've often argued that we need a, we need a what I call a math in, math out. It needs to be a mathematical formula, uh, free from tinkering. And over time, it needs to be as stable as possible, recognizing my first problem, which is natural resources cause these problems. So that's, that's the second thing that I spent a lot of time writing about. The third thing, uh, so those are two top-down views of equalization, so if you will, sort of Ottawa views. The third thing that I've spent a little bit of time looking at are the incentives of equalization. What does a recipient province, do they act differently, knowing that if they tax different things within their tax mix differently, that will affect how much money they get from Ottawa? And again, this is a, a fairly technical area of, of literature, but I think there are some, there is some evidence that provinces who receive equalization as a result, even of a math in and math out formula, will adjust some of their behaviors to account for the fact that they get equalization. If their certain revenues go down, they get they get compensated from Ottawa, so they have a bit of an incentive to keep those revenues down, and et cetera, et cetera. And it, it works better for bigger provinces than smaller provinces. And again, I could talk for hours on that. But those are the three those are the three main things uh, when I was in the sort of more wonky parts of my career that I have written a number of things about. Your last question was, 
Your last question I find the most difficult because you asked me, will the referendum deal with any of these things? And I have a few answers to that. My first answer is, I have no idea what this referendum is actually asking Albertans because the technical uh, word by word referendum question is asking us to remove something out of the constitution. And as Eric uh, has just told us, that's not something Alberta can do. And I go back to what I started with. We would never have put this in the original firewall letter because we wanted to have things Alberta could do unilaterally. The second thing is, is when the premier talks about this referendum, he talks about a broader set of issues that are not actually reflected in the referendum. He wants to talk about sharing across the country. And that's a great conversation to have. I've been writing about some of those things as well. But that's not actually what the question is asking. And uh, the third thing is, is that the referendum question doesn't address any of what I call problems and challenges with the with the with the actual formula about equalization. So. Uh, I have to lean back on what I've been saying for many years, and I'm going to steal a little bit of Jared's or say something maybe different, but in, in Jared's field, which is, in my view, there's a difference in the conversation in Alberta between what I call the big E equalization conversation, which is actually about the equalization program and the small E equalization program, which is a conversation about the relative sharing uh, and how Alberta's place and how that all fits in. And so I think, I think, Politicians in, in Alberta for many, many years have exploited this, what I call misunderstanding between the big E equalization and the small E equalization. And I think, uh, I think the current leadership is doing the same. And um, I think there's going to be a lot of confusion. I, I, there's a lot of confusion that I, can, I don't actually think can be cleared up because the actual question, what the government says they want from the question are actually two very different things. And I think it reflects the small E and big E equalization difference. So um, uh, as I've written and will continue to write, this is probably the most uh, mysterious political strategy I have ever seen uh, from a government I'm largely sympathetic to. And I think this equalization referendum will be a, will be a bad thing for Alberta, a bad thing for Jason Kenney. And uh, I wish he would just cancel it. Okay, then. Uh, I'm, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that you're feeling able to speak freely here in our forum. It's very good. Always. So tre so Trevor, I think Ken's given us a really good segue. Um, you know, people talk about fiscal capacity and whether or not Alberta is using its full fiscal capacity. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that and to whether, you know, you think the current system is fair to Albertans. Because I think, I think deep down, a lot of Albertans still feel like somehow they are paying for the policy, expensive policy choices of other provinces. Sure. So to the first question there about whether Alberta is using its fiscal capacity, well, if we think about, as the formula does, fiscal capacity as the amount you could raise at average taxes, then no, Alberta has below average tax rates and so is raising uh, less. But that's okay. The, the purpose of equalization is not for the federal government to dictate provincial policy choices. It is designed in a way to allow for for that autonomy and Albertans, British Columbians, Ontarians, uh, Quebecois resident, like everyone can choose uh, their provincial policies that they think suits them. And if a province wants low tax rates, they can compensate with, in Alberta's case, hopefully high resource revenues to compensate uh, or lower levels of spending. And those are policy choices that uh, reasonable people can disagree on and discuss. Uh, provincially and equalization really doesn't try and tilt the scales uh, on that either way. Uh, but, but to this broader question of how is the, the principle implemented, the specifics of the formula uh, that Ken was referring to, I, I completely agree that there are some real shortcomings with the, the current formula. And just let me dial the clock back to about 2007 when the formula that we have today was, uh, sorry, largely have today was originally implemented. It was a formula really designed by a panel of experts that was pulled together by former Prime Minister uh, Paul Martin, Liberal Prime Minister. Uh, then the panel did its work, chaired by uh, a really amazing Albertan, uh, deep expertise in fiscal and economic matters, Al O'Brien. Uh, they did their work following the federal election. That was kind of the then conservative uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, what their recommendations were um, that the, uh, the government at the time largely adopted. 
And this was a formula that, uh, to Ken's point, was really looking at objectively, as objectively as, as one can, what do the inputs mean for payments that each province uh, gets? Natural resources has always been an incredibly difficult issue for the formula, and there's no way around these difficulties. We've been wrestling this uh, with this issue since the formula was created. Uh, Diefenbaker initially put it in there, a Western conservative prime minister, and then uh, Pearson campaigned uh, against the inclusion of natural resources. So there's always been a good back and forth here, and the panel recommended 50% 50% of natural resources being included, not for any objective reason other than there's good arguments to exclude all of it, and there's good arguments to include all of it. So they they went with 50% as a, well, what are you going to do? This is a compromise? And that's the a, government- a, You know, that's, a, that's what I call a Tevye the milkman decision on the one hand, on the other yeah. hand. And so the government adopted that. And, and we did change the formula during the financial crisis in a way that's not working quite well for us today. Uh, and I don't want to fault a, a government for making choices during a crisis based on the expediency of, of the moment. But now, you know, we have some, some time since then. And one of the key problems with the formula today is that we fix the number of dollars that it pays out. So the size of the program actually has nothing to do with the amount of inequality that exists uh, across the country. And, and that really does undermine the purpose uh, of the program. And so that's a really big thing to think about, especially post-COVID, where it looks like we might be in a situation where inequality is quite a bit lower, actually, than it has been in many, many decades. And so we do need to think about potential reforms to that program there. But finally, I guess to the point of whether it's fair to Alberta uh, or not, well, there can be disagreement about the very idea of redistribution completely, and that's that's fair enough. And so people can view it as unfair in principle uh, for that reason uh, alone. But in terms of it not paying out to Alberta, despite the challenging recession that we went through, I, I'm skeptical of that as being a legitimate grounds to say that the program is unfair. So we went into our recession in 2015-16, the highest income province in the country by a wide margin and coming out right at the bottom of the recession, we were still the highest yeah. income, strongest economy province. So the gap has certainly shrunk uh, quite a bit, but we remain in that um, top spot in terms of per capita economic activity. And so the program, whatever tweak you might have in mind, it's just not going to pay out to Alberta despite that recession. So our economic challenges, our deficit uh, that we have right now, it's largely a choice, a consequence of provincial yeah. policy choices of, of rather than something equalization yeah. can deal with. So I'm curious, Mary, the, the subtitle of your book, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold it up again. I'm, I, I'm not getting paid to shill Mary's book. It's just, it's a very good book. Um, the subtitle is The Richer Versus the Poorer Provinces Since Confederation. And I'm, you know, versus implies, uh, you know, that there is conflict. And I'm wondering if you think that that conflict is baked into the formula and, and to the nature of equalization. Are there always going to be uh, clashes between richer and poorer provinces? Well, it came from even before confederation, when the provinces were squabbling about the subsidies. And the maritime provinces feared that with confederation, they would lose revenues and they would lose influence and they wouldn't survive. And Ottawa, the federal negotiators, did not want to admit that all provinces were not equal. So they played around behind the scenes with the subsidies pretending there were more people in the Maritimes so they could add more per capita funds. <laughs> it, it was a deception, a self-deception, but it also kept every province in the Federation. As the decades went by, you can trace it. The richer provinces, the wealthier, and the, the membership in that club changed over time. The wealthier provinces were always unwilling to admit that the poorer provinces needed more help. Occasionally, there would be breakthroughs and extra grants would be given and Ottawa would siphon off more money for struggling provinces. But the principle seemed to be intact. 
all provinces are equal, no matter how inequitous that was. So you always have the richer against the poor struggling into the 20th century. Now suddenly, each government has to do more. And people, people should move for jobs, but people shouldn't be moving because one province has a better education system or health system, uh, specific cases exempted. There should be a way to make sure that services are roughly comparable without massive taxation. It took the breakthrough of 1956 with Louis Sandroff to resolve that. All provinces were not equal, inequity would be addressed. But you know, Louis Saint Laurent paid a price for that. Ontario was furious because it felt that Ottawa was giving too much money to the poorer provinces. The Maritimes were feeling, and it's true at the beginning, there wasn't quite enough funding for them to provide social services at, at the same standard, but they got there and Diefenbaker filled in those gaps. Saint one of the reasons he was defeated, given a minority, uh, Diefenbaker getting a minority government was because of equalization and the various scuffles there between richer and poorer. And you know, you can see it today too, richer versus poor, it's still there. And it's an underlying theme of confederation. The problem is, is not to make Canadians feel they are being unjustly treated by their governments, that they're being ripped off in some way. It's fair to discuss, as we've all been saying, the pragmatism of the formula. But if we start attacking the principle massively, and just throwing it out in the referendum, I think we're going to be in a lot of trouble as a nation, as a federation. I worry about this. Yeah. You know, I mean, and this comes back to what Eric was saying. I mean, this is something that is embedded in the Constitution. I mean, in 1982, somebody thought this was important enough to write right into the Constitution. So is there a danger to our sort of overall political literacy to confront a referendum that asks us to eliminate section 36.2 of the constitution with people knowing that, I mean, at some level, people have to know that can't happen. But I mean, what's the political consequence of telling people that you can amend a constitution this way? And, you know, I, I think the provincial government is arguing that the Quebec referendum test case proves that somehow this kind of referendum question can force the federal government to the bargaining table. Is that true? Well, I can leave that the, the question about the secession reference to. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, did, did I ask? I, I think I asked Eric, but, oh, go ahead. but, yeah. but you, you can, you can both jump in because, you know, I don't want this panel to be just all me. You know, I mean, ha having the two of you talk to each other about this question is, is a good one. You well, go think, first, you go first, Jared, and I'll do cleanup. Awesome. Um, no, I mean, I, I think what, what we're getting at here is uh, first to your question, do, do people know what they're actually voting on? I, I don't think so. And I, I worry about heightened expectations after this referendum happens, as we've established, even if there is a majority of people that support it, there's unlikely to be a majority turnout in that election. Does that a mandate to negotiate on? And Eric will talk a little bit about on what, whether that actually forces other governments to the table. But I think what we're ignoring here are the longer term consequences of not being able to live up to those promises. I worry about people that will feel jilted after this and nothing happens. Equalization is not going to be removed from the Constitution or there aren't going to be meaningful changes um, to fiscal federalism. But I think we're also ignoring what our panelists have made quite clear in discussions to this point, which is that equalization is part of two Gordian knots that need to be very <laughs> need to be handled very delicately. The first is equalization is part of a constitutional bargain, right? It, it wasn't as if equalization was the only change that was made to the Canadian constitutional order in 1982. It came alongside, as, as Eric mentioned, as Ken uh, hinted at, it came alongside with providing provinces with uh, control over natural resources, particularly Western provinces. 
And uh, as anybody who's lived through Meech Lake and Charlottetown Accord eras knows, when you start talking about one part of the constitutional deal, other people will want to start talking about other aspects of it. So the worry for those of us that have lived through or studied that period is that we're about to reopen mega constitutional negotiations at a time when we should be probably focusing on economic recovery and putting the pandemic behind us. But the second Gordian knot that equalization is involved in is this mess of fiscal federalism that, that's, that Trevor has spent an entire career trying to untangle. And a lot of people forget that those changes that were made to the, to the um, equalization formula in the mid 2000s, first under, started under um, uh, the Martin government carried on by the, by the Harper government, involved not just equalization, but some pretty significant changes to health and social transfers. And those changes to health and social transfers were of immense benefit to Alberta, who for over a decade had been arguing that we need to move those transfers to a per capita basis which I won't go into the details about it, but the, the, the nuts and bolts of it resulted in Alberta gaining about $1 billion extra in healthcare funding yeah. per year. And the real risk politically and fiscally is that once we start to try to untie this knot, right, once we start to try to pick away an equalization in absence of talking about the rest of the constitution, in absence of, of, of considering its impact on changes to those fiscal transfers, Alberta runs the risk of coming out of this whole set of subsequent negotiations further behind than when we started. And that's not to say that we shouldn't be uh, entering into those negotiations, but we should probably be doing it with our eyes wide open. And Albertans should probably know the consequences of taking this first step down that path. All right. I'd like to hear Eric and then Ken. Ken, again, so Eric, and then Ken, and then I'm going to move to some questions from from uh, from our audience. Well, uh, I'm happy to agree and second uh, the points that Jared just made, which I think are are really important. But but I also think it's important to remember that all of our public figures and politicians, provincial and federal, have a role to play in keeping in making this country work. And one of the things that concerns me about the referendum and the rhetoric that certainly uh, led up to the announcement of the referendum is that Albertans are being told by their government that their money is being taken and squandered by other provinces. And in particular, to not to put too fine a point at, they're being told that that money is being squandered by Quebec. Yeah. And what does that say to the people that we have in positions of serious leadership in this country that, that national tensions are being uh, provoked uh, for what gain, I do not know. Um, so that disturbs me, number one. Number two, the implicit suggestion is that this referendum will either A, change the constitution, or B, if it doesn't, then it's somebody's fault that you are being treated so unfairly and that fault is laid at the hands of a federal government that doesn't work for Albertans or other provinces. What does that do to uh, there, there's some supposed partisan gain that I suppose comes from framing it in that way. But what does it do for the rest of us uh, who ha have to live in a country that works? What does that do for further provoking Western alienation and a nascent uh, independence movement in Alberta? We are being set up for a, I think, uh, very fractious uh, fall when all of these expectations that have been stoked um, are going to come to absolutely nothing, which I think is is the last part of this question. Um, well, doesn't the secession reference tell you that if you have a referendum, the gates uh, of political change open up before you and all will be made fine? Um, well, the secession reference question in 1998 involved the Supreme Court of Canada being asked right after the cusp of the, almost the breakup of the country itself, could a province, guess which province we're thinking about, could a province unilaterally secede from the Federation? And in 1998, the Supreme Court of Canada said, well, here's what the rules of the game are. The amending formula doesn't talk about independence referenda, but if there is such a referenda to gain independence and remove yourself from the country, then that would give rise to a duty to negotiate some form of constitutional change. 
by the other partners to Confederation. Now, does that mean, as the government of Alberta suggests, they're not alone in that, some academics hold this view as well, that any referendum on any constitutional topic then requires, mandates, constitutional negotiations that lead to constitutional change, because that's the wording of the Supreme Court of Canada reference. You've got to negotiate constitutional change after a secession vote. And in my view, that's a complete misreading of that case. There are paragraphs of the decision which speak about that solely in the context of a secession vote. To make that clear, there is a heading in the judgment which says secession in, this is what happens if there's a secession vote. And then the paragraphs discuss the duty to negotiate. There are earlier, and I'll stop in a moment. There are earlier portions of the judgment that say, this is the good news. We live in a democracy. Any province can initiate constitutional change. Of course they can. We want them to do so. What does that do? Well, it means that there should be, the court says, constitutional discussions that follow from any uh, effort to invoke constitutional change. Well, that makes sense. So what is Alberta getting? They're getting what they always had. They're getting what the amending formula has always given them, which is that if a single province wants to change the constitution, the other people in confederation have to discuss that issue. Change the constitution, negotiate a change to the constitution? Absolutely not. That is not happening. And Ken. Um, uh, Jared had some great comments about unintended consequences. So let me, let me add one that we haven't talked about and let me put it under the category of a rich province defense of equalization to not go contrary to Mary, but just to add to that. I think there's a very powerful, very strong argument why rich provinces like Alberta should defend equalization and it goes as follows. In Canada, you have many provinces that couldn't afford to deliver the kind of services that we all love to have our provincial governments deliver in Alberta. And if we didn't have equalization, you would have provinces in Atlantic Canada and Manitoba and perhaps Quebec, although it's a special case, clamoring to the federal government to start delivering programs that we in Alberta want to deliver ourselves. And so equalization should be seen as part of a collective bargain whereby provinces like Alberta get to run more of its own affairs, the sort of core of the firewall letter or the core of 25 years of my political career in Alberta. We Alberta should do more and be able to run more. Without equalization, if you take the ability of the Atlantic provinces and Manitoba and other provinces to be able to run those programs themselves, suddenly the incentive for the federal government to take over education education, education, all the things, healthcare, that I think would be a disaster for Canada goes up. So I think there's a rich province argument in favor of equalization. And I've used the word, this is a small bribe that Alberta pays the rest of the country to let us run our own affairs. It's kind of an inflammatory way to say it. But, but when I talk to my right-wing friends in Alberta, that's the kind of language I use with them. It's like, this is a very small price to pay to allow Alberta to run its own affairs. And we've got to keep it here in order that we can keep running our own affairs instead of having other provinces, seven provinces with 50% of the population starting to ask Ottawa to run equal, to run education. We're gonna lose out on that. So let's be careful about the unintended consequences. So on top of the ones that Jared identified, I would add that, that the, the fundamental decentralized nature of Canada, which uh, in my view, makes Canada the best country in the world is at risk if we get rid of equalization. And that's sort of a, a rich province, if I dare say so, right-wing defense of equalization. And uh, I'm very happy to make it here and elsewhere. That is terrific. I have a lot of questions from people. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out sort of, you know, we, we've, we've taken up more time than I meant to, but the conversation has been so terrific. I didn't want to cut anyone off. So I'm going to try and get through some questions uh, and not have all five of you answer them, but try to have the people who are, you know, most on point so that we can move through the questions. So the first one comes from Lori Bear Kosh. Uh, and one of her questions is, why is Quebec's hydro excluded from the transfer payment calculation? She says, this feeds into the rage of Westerners because Quebec is currently the biggest recipient of the program. Quebec will never be anything but a have-not province if we continue to give them special rules that other provinces don't. So uh, maybe, Trevor, uh, I will get you to take that question. Sure. So uh, let me un unpack that in a number of ways. So first, 
Quebec's hydro revenues, along with British Columbia hydro revenues and Manitoba, those are other large hydro producing provinces, those revenues are included. Uh And they are included and treated in in the same way as oil and gas royalties or stumpage fees from forestry and so on. So so it's there. Um, And and indeed, this is why removing resource revenues from the equalization formula formula would in most years lead to substantial increases in payments for Quebec uh, because it does have a large amount of resource revenues. And just for context, if we were to remove resource revenues, then since 2010, Quebec would have received about $9.8 billion in additional equalization payments because they are a large hydro uh, producer. Um, But that's not to say that there aren't unique challenges with hydro revenues in the formula. Absolutely. So uh, Ken earlier noted some adverse incentive uh, issues with equalization. I think hydro is potentially the starkest one. So think about where these revenues come from. They come from generating electricity and selling it to consumers who are resident of your province. And you as a government can kind of choose what those electricity prices are and so can effectively choose how much hydro revenues come in. So a a government can potentially, uh, let's say, underprice power in their province, having lower revenues, and therefore appearing to have a lower fiscal capacity than they, quote, really do. And so in Quebec's case, I mean, whether or not this is an actual choice being made by the government, I'll I'll leave that to others, but mechanically, uh, Quebec's equalization entitlement uh, this year of $13.1 billion, if they were to raise power prices by one cent per kilowatt hour, Uh, their equalization payment would decline by almost $900 million. And so if the Quebec government is is not choosing to set power prices in a way that considers that, they probably should, uh, just from their own uh, perspective. So so there are real issues there, and there are ways to address it. and, And that's where some productive engagement on formula design uh, should be had. A- absolutely. But it's more than just Quebec, BC and Manitoba um, as well. And more than just hydro. If we were to drop royalty rates, for example, then our fiscal capacity would also appear uh, to be to be lower. And so these are these are some of the challenges with the, the formulas design that do require some thoughtful uh, engagement on the issue. All right. I have a question from Knut Peterson. Uh, and maybe I'll send this to, to Ken or Ken and then Trevor. Uh, if Alberta ever gets around to implementing a provincial sales tax, would that affect the current amount of money that Alberta pays in equalization? No. Okay. Uh, that was simple. Um, <laughs> well, just, just quickly to, to follow up there. Alberta pays nothing uh, into... Yes, yes sorry. I, I, yeah, I think, I think it, you meant Albertans. Yes. And so would us changing our, our tax um, structure to include, say, an HST, doesn't matter what rate that is. We could bring one in at 1% or 5% or 20%. Not a single dollar would change in terms of the total size of the program uh, paid out from Ottawa. And it wouldn't result in Alberta receiving uh, anything more than the zero that it, it currently does. All right. Sheldon Rose question. Are there tax sources which are excluded from the formula? And could such uh, an exclusion change the way uh, payments are made? So so there are some important revenue sources that that are excluded. I think a big one that's super relevant, uh, at least in Alberta's case, is investment income. So the Heritage Fund, we have have a large pool of savings uh, in Alberta, 20 billion plus in the Heritage Funds and various endowment funds kicking out between typically two and $3 billion a year. And, and that's excluded. Um, the rationale for its exclusion is kind of similar to the rationale that can put forward to exclude resource revenues. It's earnings off of a capital asset. And so it's very, it's fundamentally different than, than taxation. So yeah, including things uh, like that would indeed change the allocation of the payments, but again, wouldn't result in Alberta receiving anything. I mean, including that would actually increase our fiscal capacity even more. All right. This is a question that I don't know if you can answer, but maybe Jared would take a stab at it. 
uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've lost the name of the person. This is a question from Jean, who asks, do you have any idea where the funding for the yes side of this referendum is coming from? Well, we, we do know that the provincial government changed legislation to allow government members, in other words, cabinet ministers, to campaign on behalf of one side or another of a provincial referendum. So that's the first time that that's happened in this province. Um, you know, just from an observer standpoint, I'd like to think of myself as pretty plugged in, but, but we haven't seen a lot of um, campaigning in, in favor of it, aside from a few responses at the podium to in, 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 in terms of press conferences from other um, you know, on other topics like COVID and so on. So, um, yeah, it, I mean, it, to the extent that there is a, or could be a campaign in favor of removing equalization from the constitution, it would probably be funded by the government side. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't anticipate seeing massive, uh, you know, b- billboards or TV or radio ads on one side or another of this campaign. And I think that that's because of two for two very quick reasons. First is um, this this as much as we want to talk about the ins and outs of this formula and the program, this referendum has nothing to do with the formula or the program. As we've made clear today, this is about the principle of sharing within a federation, and that principle is in, is in, you know enshrined in the constitution. And this is my second point: for a government um, within Canada, led by uh, someone who considers himself to be a federalist it's difficult to make an argument against sharing, right? And we can make an, an argument against, fair, against uh, you know, the, this whole entire system as being unfair. But I think that the government in trying to, you know, thread the needle with this constitutional argument that we have to make it about the constitution because that will require in their minds that the rest of Canada sit down and negotiate with us by bringing the constitution into it, they've really closed off conversations like we're having right now about ways that equalization as a formula could be improved. Um, you know, we're being forced to, to, to talk about whether we want to share with the rest of Canada. Um, and again, our public opinion research suggests that more Albertans are in the mood to build bridges with the rest of Canada right now, particularly after the pandemic. We've seen actually a surge in support for the rest of Canada with, among Albertans than they are to, to borrow um, to borrow Ken's phrase to build a firewall around Alberta. Um, and, and so it, it'll be interesting to see who actually turns out to vote this fall. Yeah, that is the interesting question. And, you know, I mean, I guess it's not, I I don't want to single out any order of government, any politician, because I'm seeing this from almost everyone right now. It's like a willful misunderstanding of constitutional conventions and the written constitution itself. Um, There was a story today, you know, someone, someone, um, uh, suggesting that maybe the governor general shouldn't call an election just because the prime minister asks. And I mean, Eric, I guess, um, what what mischief is made? What misunderstandings grow up when people all across the political spectrum, you know, whether, it, you know, they want the queen to do this, they want the governor general to that, they want the constitution, you know, are we painting ourselves into a, a society where people lack the the political literacy to understand the way in which they are actually governed. Well, I think you're right to to put, I think, this referendum in a a larger narrative about ways in which constitutional literacy uh, is, I think, sometimes, or maybe it's constitutional illiteracy is being exploited for partisan ends. And that's a bad state of affairs in your your constitutional democracy because uh, when that happens when there's when when the public is led to believe that this in fact is all just about power relations um, that there are in fact are no real rules of the game that govern us if everything is up for grabs then you begin to lose track of the threads that that bind us into a community uh, of, of a functioning nation and I don't think we need to be overly dramatic here by looking south of the border to see what can happen when, when you begin to erode constitutional norms and the institutions uh, that I think stand above partisan politics that are so crucial to the functioning of a democracy. And that includes the crown and the office of the governor general. That includes Elections Canada. That includes in some respects, the constitution itself. It's, it's, of course, it's a political document with lots of constitutional politics as part of it. You can't hopefully pull that apart. 
but there are elements of our constitutional lives together that need to be respected by not only citizens, but especially by the players of the game. And all the steps that we take that begin to erode that notion, erode those understandings, go a little bit further, stoke that misunderstanding a little bit more for a very short term supposed political gain, we all lose. We all lose in that equation. And I'm afraid to say it, to be blunt, that is what is happening with this equalization referendum. We have come to precisely one o'clock. And I think that is a pretty great place to leave this panel. Uh, I want to thank everyone who's been watching on YouTube and Facebook and live tweeting on Twitter. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dina Dong and Cynthia Wagner from my office who did so much to make this panel possible. But most of all, I want to thank Trevor Toom, Ken Bosenkuhl, Eric Adams, Mary Janigan, and Jared Wesley. Uh, this has been an absolutely terrific hour of conversation. I suspect that the six of us could go on for another hour, but I will not try the patience of all of the people who have been watching. Uh, and if you have been watching and you enjoyed this panel, please do share the link on, on Facebook and YouTube uh, because this panel will exist there in perpetuity. Uh, share this with everybody you know who you think ought to hear it. And uh, Dina and, and Ame in my office and I will be working hard to also prepare this as a podcast for our continuing series, Alberta Unbound. So I want to say merci beaucoup à tous. I want to say hi hi. And I want to thank you all uh, for this marvelous hour. Take care. Stay well. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.